Welcome to the Yours in Marketing podcast. Hey, it's Blake here. If this is the first time that you're joining us on the Yours in Marketing podcast, do me a favor. Please go wherever you get your podcast, doesn't matter where, and please review, rate, subscribe to the podcast right now. Well, or after the episode, whichever works for you. We're really looking for your support so that we can build this and make it even more valuable for you. So please rate, review, and subscribe the Yours in Marketing podcast. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. On this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Morgan Ingram, who is a video creator, a mentor, an entrepreneur, a speaker, but most notably, he's the director of sales execution and evolution at Jay Barrows. And what you're going to get out of this episode, it's going to be really sales focused, but also a lot of marketing in there. This is a marketing podcast after all. But here are three key things that he talks about that you're going to learn more about. First, how to become a top voice on LinkedIn, which is something that he accomplished pretty quickly. Second, what separates a meh SDR from a great one? And then finally, we talk about why video games could actually be the future of marketing. So let's get right into it. All right, we're good. We're live. And I've got Morgan Ingram here with us today. Morgan, how are you doing? Good. How are you guys doing? Good. Doing great. So Morgan is a sales thought leader. He is a LinkedIn top voice. He works for Jay Barrows. You are, if correct me if I'm wrong, you are the director of... You're the, you're the director of sales execution and evolution. There you go. There you go. There okay. It is. Yeah, <laughs> so it's a long, it it's a long title. <laughs> so you've been there for, uh, you're coming up on your second year, looks like, but you, you've been involved in a lot of different things. You're, you're young, but you're already a top voice on LinkedIn. So there's a lot of wisdom to unpack here. And I definitely want to get into the sales, but I want to start out with kind of your origin story. So instead of just asking you to tell me the whole story, I really want to get to the bottom of your professional career, how that all started. And and actually, if you could take us through as well, how you got into your career, how you got to where you are now, and then also the key principles or morals that have come out of it so far that you live by every day. It's a loaded question there, man. It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let me, let me tackle the first one. So how did it all start? So I first role was an SDR role. Um, at a local company in Atlanta. It was, it was a startup. And I actually, when I came out of college, I wanted to be a sports agent. So Jerry Maguire showed me the money. Like I was like, yo, that's me, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And as I went through a college, I graduated from UGA and I had a finance and sports management degree. So I double majored because that's where I wanted to go. And then when I got towards the end, they were like, hey, you could have a law degree. And I was like, yeah, that's not happening. So after seeing how much that cost and then realizing <laughs> that's not my path, I then made a decision to go into marketing. I was I liked marketing. I did like a got a good context around there. And then so once I figured that out and I went to multiple jobs, I forgot that wasn't me either. So then I had to make a decision like what I was gonna do. So I was interviewing for these SDR positions. I I just was like, let me just get the sales, whatever. We'll see what it's about. And then I cold called my the VP of sales at the time. And she was like, hey, look, you can, we can come in for an interview. I had the interview with them, and then I ended up joining the team. And then I was on that team for two years until I left, and then obviously joined Jay Barrows. But how that all went down was I started off as an SDR. I made a post the other day. Like, first three months, I didn't. I was struggling. I did not do well. Um, I wasn't not good at what I did at all. <laughs> but I just wasn't giving 100%. And then I, when I decided to give 100%, that's when everything changed for me. Um, and then that's when I started doing well in the role and then everything, everything really took off from there, which was awesome. And then from that point, I uh, created the SCR Chronicles. So that's the podcast, the YouTube channel. And then from there, uh, I got promoted to SCR manager. I managed 13 reps. And then after that, um, I got founded on YouTube by John Barrows. And then we had a conversation, ended up joining his team. And then today, what I do is I'll go train teams, like full sales cycle, AEs, AEs, SDRs, BDRs on prospecting and how to be more effective, how to be more efficient in the process as a whole. So basically, the, the way that you got on at Jay Barrows was through your YouTube channel. Yeah, it was through YouTube. It was per, so personal brand and, and social selling and then sharing content. That's how, that's how it basically found me and then obviously hired me. That's, that's kind of how it goes in the new world now. Like if, if you want to stand out, because everybody sends in a resume to places and they all look the same. Yeah. If you're going to stand out, you have to do something different. And most people aren't willing to take the time to create content like that. They're not, not at all. And, and, but that's the biggest vantage point you have. And you got to take advantage of that every single time, like making content, getting in front of them. I think it's, it's super important. Well, how, how much time a week do you spend just creating content, videos, oh, LinkedIn gosh. posts, podcasts? That's a really 
great question. Wow. It's maybe, so I try to spend two to three hours to create the, again, caveat. So people think that's may not be a lot or they may think it's a lot, but it's actually not that much because over time I've gotten better. Like it used to take me like a whole day to think of like one post for like the next day. Yeah. Right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now I could do two to three, four hours. Like actually this past World Day weekend, I spent about four to five hours creating videos for the next two months uh, to get ahead. But I can do that at a very fast speed because I have a document of topics. I have a document of what people want to hear as from the sales and sales development world or want to hear from me. And so I just pick it and I roll with it. And then, you know, there's other people in the background who help me facilitate that. So over time, like, you know, it's become easier. But also, you never run out of content because people always think they're going to run out of something, but you don't because you're living life. So as long as you're living life and as long as you're in a role or as long as you're like have a job, you should always have a piece of content because there's always something you can say. You always have a voice. And that essentially, you know, the second question there was like the impact, like that's where the impact comes into play. I've been sharing content on LinkedIn for the past three or four years straight, like every single day. So like over time that compounds and it's, it's just being consistent. And ultimately like anything in life is just being consistent. Like if you're not, if you decide to be consistent, you'll beat out a lot of people because you just keep doing it every single day and you're going to get better because you do it. That, that's a great point, though, because especially on LinkedIn, you know, as well as anybody recently, the algorithm kind of <laughs> didn't didn't help us out too much with yes. uh, with content creators. And so now, especially people with bigger followings are starting to lose a lot because the organic reach has dropped. So staying consistent, obviously, is huge because you're going to have those ups and downs. But how have you, I guess, how have you navigated that since the algorithms changed? Did that discourage you at all? Or did, did you just say to yourself, better just keep with it? Honestly, man, I, I haven't even really noticed that. To begin with. Really? <laughs> like, no, because uh, my whole thing is, as long as you're giving value to the audience, obviously the most overused thing when we talk about personal brand, but hmm. when you're essentially giving some amount of value and you know you're helping solve problems to your content, you don't really think too much about the algorithm. Yeah, you know, obviously we want to reach as many people as possible. Yeah, we want to make sure that we have impact. But my whole thing, as long as you have a message that makes sense and it hits home with people, like it will, you will reach the people you need to reach. So my focus is always on looking at the comments, looking at my messages, what are people struggling with and, and bringing them the most value around that. And then that in itself will fix any algorithm problem you have. Now, obviously, you got to make adjustments. Like, you can't just drop a YouTube link on and LinkedIn. That's not going to work because now they have a video platform. But when I first started out, dropping a YouTube video link was working because there was no video context within LinkedIn. So, obviously, I'm getting higher views, higher comments, higher likes, right? Now, they have a video component. You can't do that. I don't drop YouTube links inside it because it's not going to work. Any link that goes outside of LinkedIn is going to be completely ostracized because now they have uploads for photos and they have uploads for video so that would be a dumb decision for you to make so i think it's also just understanding the story and the narrative of the platform um and then within that not being discouraged when, the, when it changes it's changing with the platform and making those adjustments it's just like with anything right it's like sports like for sure you can't be like you can't be like oh man this guy's killing us so like we should just just sit there and just let him kill us like you need to make adjustments to what's happening absolutely well talking about value and also kind of melting that together you kind of have a content calendar right so you're yeah. you're putting these things together ahead of time how do you have a process for actually finding problems that people need solved so that you can answer those questions on social media or through ser chronicles or wherever it may be do you have like a process or do you just kind of in your head you come up with things that you think are problems and then you solve them well, I have a, you know, like in my role, I'm super fortunate where, you know, I'm going doing trainings on site with clients. And so I get asked questions while I'm on site. So those questions turn into content. Hey, I was in a training session last week. Someone said this to me, super interesting question. Then I dive into more context in that because no one's obviously going to know what that one-on-one -on -one conversation was with that one rep. But if I put it out there, then they can get the context there. And then on top of that, like I get messages all the time with questions. So I use that as leverage. And then people or I always see content that's very high level like this is something you should think about and then i'll take that and be like this is how you should do it so I, I just i'm always i'm just on linkedin looking at what people are commenting messages emails that i get conversations i have and those in lieu turn into content so there's always a repertoire of it and then like i said i have a document of like just topics so anything that comes up i just put it in the document and there's like so much in there that like <laughs> it's we're good to go yeah <laughs> for sure so i mentioned before you're you're a linkedin top voice Obviously, a big part of that is because you've just been consistent over the past four years, every day yeah. posting something. But is there anything else that went into that 
did you have to actually apply for anything? Did somebody have to nominate you for that? Or does it just, does it just happen by virtue of creating good content? That is the uh, most satisfactory thing that's happened to me from a professional standpoint. Like joining John's in the top five, uh, doing what I do now is top five I always want to do. But getting that award meant the most to me. And because it was, so first of all, it's selected by LinkedIn. So LinkedIn chooses those people. It's not just like a poll. Like LinkedIn goes in from their content distribution of uh, leaders and they go choose those people. So that meant a lot to me because I've been mean, like, oh, wow, okay, I'm actually bringing a lot of impact here. And then also it shows that you're actually bringing the most genuine value and people are actually getting stuff out of it. So that for me, like that award like, meant the most to me for sure. And on top of that, like that's where it came from. But what it comes down to, like obviously being consistent, but also being, again, this is cliche, authentic, right? That's a part of it, right? Yeah. Everyone knows that, but I'm gonna get like super strategic and like tell you exactly how it happened. All I did was I went to the top 100 sales leaders at the time. So like what's when I just started. So like 2015, 2016. And so I found out who those people were. I listened and followed their content, figure out like why they were in the top, why people liked them. Then I looked up the top hundred podcasts. So I listened to those. Um, and then uh, from there, what I did is I just created the SDR Chronicles. And then I used that SDR Chronicles as leverage to then get on other podcasts as well. And so essentially I was just on ev almost every single podcast. And then on top of that, like I continuously was just hopping on different stuff all across the board. So I was just like on every podcast, on everything. I was just everywhere. And so that was the, that was the catalyst point. That was like where it, like everything went super fast because I was being consistent. I was asking people to be on my podcast to bring a different perspective. Or I would say, Hey, I bring this unique perspective. I'm going to come on the podcast. Here's the reason. And I would have, I mean, I would just sit there and just do that to everybody. So I quickly connected with all the top leaders and quickly connected with all the people who were posting content. And then I became part of the mix because I was creating content and then also sharing my advice on those platforms. So then over time, I would say I grew with those interviews. That sounds like a lot of work. It is a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying I can't just like post random links on LinkedIn and then get rewarded for it? Well, right. that's the thing. It's like, and then <laughs> people, and that's, people always say, oh man, why you post so much content? Like people could do exactly what, like, I just told you exactly what I did. Right. Yep. And I always tell people, I can tell you exactly what I do, but it doesn't mean you're going to do it. 97% of people, when they get your advice, they won't do it. Even though it's exactly what you would do for success. It's because yep. it's, it's not easy <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. to, to go and go create something and then do your job and then also edit. And at the same time, I was like, I was still, a, I was a top performing rep, right? So I was not only doing my job as a sales rep, I was also creating content and then also getting on podcasts and then also like editing all that stuff at the same time. So it's like all that was happening in the mix. It wasn't just like, I was just creating videos. Mm -hmm. It was like, I wanted more. So I did more. But you got to decide on yourself. Is that what you want to do, right? For it's sure. not for everybody, but you got to be like, if you want to do it, you got to commit to it, do it. But the game plan and the action plans, the blueprints, they're all out there. Well, historically for you, which has been, which has motivated you more, which has been more fulfilling, the actual content creation or your, your role in sales? That is a fantastic question. Uh, for me, I've always enjoyed the content creation. I've been creating content since I was 16, 17 years old. So for me to create and be a creative that more so is is the most appealing to me. If I can't be creative, like I just can't do it. Just I'll just like give up. Not give up. I'll just be very bored and name in the process. I have to be doing that. So I would say above all, because I've been doing that longer than sales, right? And then I would say sales is like right there because sales allows you to be creative and you always can A B test. So it, it's that tandem that has been really effective for me. But I always lean towards the creation and the, the creativity and creating that content. Because that's what I've been doing the longest and that's what sure. I've been like locked in on. But sales is like right there because like it allows me to be creative and allows me to do that process. Sure. And it's not, it, I mean, they go hand in hand, right? Because you're not, right. you're not creating content about zoology. You're, <laughs> you're creating, yeah, you're creating content. content. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to see that actually. Could you start just a, a beginner zoology <laughs> YouTube channel? Zoology. <laughs> it's actually funny that you do mention that though, because I think this is actually an important Thing that you just made up that uh, you just said here because if you're like obviously 100 focus on sales that's great but also think you need to like show humanity and talk about different stuff mm -hmm. so like i have a post it's called like fun fact friday or whatever and i always like post about stuff that's like not sales related so i'm like hey like i really like video games so like i'll actually talk about like video games with like other people that's like outside of sales or like i'll talk about music or whatever and i think it's important that you talk about other things that aren't 
necessarily focus on that one derivative of like what you do. Obviously, the core focus of me is like sales and sales development. And some people know me, but I'm still going to drop some knowledge on other things across the board. Sure. Well, I want to ask you a question. You don't have to have an answer to this. This is going to be a weird question, but you mentioned you mentioned you love video games. So yeah. this is a marketing podcast, marketing and sales podcast. So I'd love, love to know in terms of video games and going forward in the future, they're just going to get bigger and bigger. Eventually, how does marketing come into play with with video games? How are we going to start like using marketing tactics in video games to sell? <laughs> this is funny because uh, so actually I in college I ran an esports company. So I did it for like eight, eight to nine months. And so I understand the marketing piece. Uh, we have sponsorships and things of that nature. I did, we hosted video game tournaments on college campuses. So essentially, I believe that esports gaming is the future. That is the most interesting and appealing industry, me, industry to me right now. Because I don't think people understand like the, the maximum exposure that games <laughs> yeah. have. Yeah. And I don't think people understand how many people actually play video games is heavily slept on and you know back in the day i used to play halo 2 and i was like on like a semi-pro team and like i was like getting after it so like the whole thing is like i knew it was going to be big like way before everyone uh, is now like obviously people get paid millions of dollars to go stream i wish twitch was there back in the day but we didn't we, all, we only had like camtasia and stuff but the whole point though is i believe marketing will start obviously getting the video games now will there be an ad while i'm playing a video game i don't i don't necessarily think they're going to do that because that's i think that's too invasive of your privacy while you're well, playing they, a video game they do that on apps on app games right so, on so app I mean, games correct right and those obviously those are freemium models right? right where you obviously download it it's free they're going to do they're going to get you from a mobile perspective but if so you if, purchase the game then it's different right so if we're going mobile 100 percent, like you should be attacking mobile app games hard if you're in advertising like you got to think about how many downloads those games against like clash of clans and things of nature like there's tons of stuff there yep 100 percent. i'm talking about like the actual video game space I believe where you're going to get the advertisement play is you're going to get it where they're going to start hosting more tournaments. So most people don't know this, but the Philadelphia 76ers, the Atlanta Hawks, actually know a couple people over there. We've been yep. talking about this. NBA, like the Golden State Warriors, they, I think Sacramento Kings has it too. Those teams have actually bought esports teams and they're actually now doing Madden esports games and NFL games. So the marketing will actually come into play there because obviously the NBA and, NF, and then NFL, they're starting to do too. They have land grab on marketing. Think about the Super Bowl, NBA Finals, all that stuff. So they'll actually will start putting their marketing spin inside of those games because at the end of the day, those gamers are not getting exposed to maybe the products that those people are showing. So long story short, it's going to be prevalent. Uh, if you if I was a marketer, I would be paying attention to the gaming space because it's only going to get noisier and it's only going to get more accessibility in the, in the spot. Especially if you're trying to target Gen Zs, like you should be there all day long. Well, yeah. I mean, the reason I ask that is because right now, I think a lot of the older people in B2B leadership are going to say, I don't play video games. I'm not interested in that. I think that they rot people's brains. They don't understand it, but that is going to be the future. And so like, I guess, follow up question. Do you find it weird thinking about when you and I are 75 years old, we're going to be playing Madden or Halo, Halo 59? Like, is that weird to you? I, mean, I already know. I mean, I'm telling you what's going to happen right now. It's like, we're not even <laughs> people. It's going to be like that movie, um, player, player one. Mm-hmm. That's what I feel. Like, that's like ready player one. Ready, ready player, player one. one that movie. That's just, that's where we're going. Like whether people like it or not, like you got to think about all the, think about it. You think about all the people that are like depressed and overweight, all that stuff. Right. Like they go to, they go do escapism. So those escapisms are going to go drink, going to do, go do drugs, or they go out and do a concert, they go to a movie, or they go play video games. Those are the escapisms. But those keep you in a realm of reality that you eventually have to come back. It's going to get to a point where obviously, I mean, Oculus Rift, a, a, I mean, I, there's a VR bar here in Atlanta that I went to. And like, I felt like I was there. Like if my friends were there, I probably would have been there for a week. <laughs> just playing games you know i'm like yo where's morgan at like yo i'm at, I'm at the vr bar like, you come out bother. you're like what year is it yeah exactly like yo you just wasted five years in there oh my bad so my whole point is that we're moving to a world where people will be going in these vr ar games and they'll be there because they want to escape reality and that's unfortunate but that's where we're going right now so it's just understanding okay how can we make sure people from a marketing perspective right understand what their reality is get them to that experience that they're trying to go to but on top of that like that vr ar is going to be a massive play and i believe that's where we're headed where people will be going in a game and play live action and the thing is like 
people need that. You know, people need to get away from the reality sometimes and do that. So for sure, it's definitely common. Well, that that transitions perfectly into something else that you focus heavily on, which is that idea of liberation of your negative thoughts. Yeah. So escapism ties into that directly. People, you know, whether they're suffering with depression or or other things, they just need an escape. Right now, when you're talking about liberating yourself from negativity, there are a lot of people in marketing sales positions, whether they're leaders, whether they're individual contributors that are struggling right now at work. They they don't feel fulfilled or they feel overwhelmed. There are a lot of different th- you know things that can happen at work. But what advice would you give to somebody specifically professionally that could help them to get rid of that negativity in their life? Change your circle. That's it. It really is changing your friends. Like once you do that, a lot changes. So you know I have a mastermind group. There's me and three other guys, so four people in the group, and we just have spreading positivity, setting goals, getting stuff done. Like if you don't have the positive people around you, then that leads to that negative environment. So you got to find people who aren't complaining and like, oh, they don't have a solution to things. You got to find people who have solutions to encourage you, empower you to get to point. And once you understand that, then that's as, as a whole going to make you better as a person. And so I always encourage people to find those people that are going to elevate you. Except when I did my first public speaking, that was, that was the talk track. It was like everything changed for my life when I started reading positive things. I stopped watching TV that was negative. I started listening to podcasts that were grow, helping me grow. And I surrounded myself with people who wanted to see me grow and were positive around me. And they weren't negative. And once you do that, that's also a big point. And then write down what you're grateful for every single day. People don't do that. People don't think about what's, what am I grateful for? What's actually positively happening in my life? We always go into a negative state because that's what we want to go into, which is not good. So you got to stay away from that. Focus on the stuff that's positive. Have you, do you have any experience firing people from your life that you want to share? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it sucks. I mean, uh, yeah, I had a conversation with someone and I was just like, Hey, look, you know, we've been friends for a while, but you know where I'm trying to go, like, it's not where you're trying to go. So ha- have you ever had a time where you've had to fire somebody from your life? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and it's a tough conversation because at the end of the day, you don't want to, you don't want to be mean, but you also need to respect your, yourself. And so like in that, like what I've had to do is just been like, Hey, look, so where I'm going at my right life right now, like these are the things I'm looking to accomplish. And you know, based on where you're at, these are the things you're looking to accomplish. So it sounds like just right now we're not in alignment, like in our lives right now, to be as close as we are. And then it's just more so like, I can be an acquaintance. Like if you need me, hit me up. But from here moving forward, like I got to go do me. And yeah, I've had to fire a lot of people because they just weren't just where I was at and where I wanted to go. They weren't there to accept that. And they were only dragging me down because they, they haven't matured. They were still doing, they weren't just in the direction that I wanted them to be in. So it just was like, ah, like this is, this is not where I, this is not where I wanted to be. You know what I'm saying? That was for me, like uh, finding those people out in my life. And what I always tell people is like, when you get rid of people in your life, it opens up seats for the right people to come in. So we want to hold on to those people, but you got to let them go if they're not, even if it's they're not even a negative influence, if they're just not trying to go where you're trying to go and they're like bringing you down. Cause it doesn't have to be negative. It can just be like, just bringing you down. Like sure. just not having the right energy. Cause it's all about energy. Right. So, do you think so now now in this age of social media, I'd be curious to know if you think that that kind of if social media naturally harbors an environment of negativity or if you if you think it's inherently good, if it's inherently bad, obviously you can make good or bad of it yourself, but just naturally, what do you think that social media lies? Uh it's just I mean it's for good and bad, right? Like the bad is like what people post on it and they're you know, it's a self-absorbing thing. Obviously, you can get super caught up into it. And then also, it can be for good, right? Because you can bring out, you can connect with people, you can build relationships, you can post value. So I think we're in a world right now, we have to decide what is social media for you. Um, and I know it can be super polarizing and can put you in a bad spot, but you have to know going on there, like, hey, I'm here for value. I'm not here to just like go on here for negativity or whatnot. If you had, since you create so much content, you're kind of everywhere, at least uh, you're you're on Twitter, you're on LinkedIn, you're on YouTube, you've got a podcast, right? So if you had to pick one social media platform and then you had to leave the rest by the wayside, couldn't do do anything with them ever again, which one would you pick and why? LinkedIn. And, and the, <laughs> it's very simple. Um, and the reason is because it has, it's the most impactful platform right now that has, that has not been tapped into correctly. Essentially, there is so much room for growth. There's so much real estate you can capitalize on. And at the same time, those people who are on that platform obviously make decisions. And obviously, you can have a long standing career based off your personal brand on LinkedIn. 
right? Like Twitter, like it's there, but like it's just not as prevalent anymore. YouTube, depending on what you're trying to do, it could be prevalent. But if you're in a B2B space and you're a professional, and like in my sense, like if you're building content on LinkedIn, you have a brand, like people are going to know you and you're going to be able to have just more accessibility to do the things you want to do, regardless of the position that you're looking for. All right. Let's, I, I want to shift a little bit more toward the sales side because that's obviously your forte. Yeah. And well, I guess we can stick a little bit with the with the social media as well. But in terms of LinkedIn, how do you actually use LinkedIn for your sales efforts? So not creating content, but actually outreach and, and trying to close deals. Yeah. So I send personalized LinkedIn invitation notes to my personas based on the segmentation of that talk track. And then what I do from there is I also send people LinkedIn voice messages and LinkedIn videos. That's how I prospect. Like I do that all the time and that's how I get my responses. And then I set up meetings from there and then I make sure I can allocate that time based on what I'm doing. So yeah, I'm always trying to make sure I set up my things across the board to make sure that I'm good to go. And then I sell accordingly based on also what people post, screenshots, all that stuff is intertwined together. And are, are there any bad behaviors that you see on LinkedIn on the, as, on the SDR <laughs> side? You just see way too often that yeah. you would discourage? Um, it's the connect and dump. Uh, so essentially you connect with someone and you dump like a novel on them. <laughs> I've gotten those novels. Uh, that's the worst practice. I think a worst practice also is just not having any context of who you're reaching out to, commenting in their status to be like, you haven't responded to my email. Those are not things you should be doing. I, I definitely agree with that. In general, yeah. not not even on LinkedIn, but just in general, when you're working with SDRs, what other bad behaviors come up that you think should just be nipped in the bud right here on this podcast? Anybody that's an SDR that's listening to this, don't do these things. I have a video, actually, that is the 10 commandments of the SDRs, things you should not do. <laughs> so that, that actually has them all in there. Uh, but essentially, I, I think the big things is one making sure that you are not just doing the same motions as everybody else. Like that's the number one problem with SDRs. I've done the same thing is having the same intro. Everyone else does uh, doing the same connection request that everyone else does to the same pitch that everyone else does. Like that's what you stay away from. Um, I think also too is can not just sending out messages, send out messages, like just content, content, content. I got to send a thousand emails because I can, you'll get responses, but you're going to burn a lot of people on the, on the way. Um, I think another thing as well is, to take your role seriously. I think a lot of this, a lot of people don't do. They see the SDR role as like, oh, I got to get out here as soon as possible, but don't understand the, you're only in the role for mostly 12 to 24 months for most jobs. And that's only two years out of your 50 year, 60 year career. So it's really not that much time. So you might as well master it and be really great on it because it's only going to help you move forward. So I think those are the mistakes that SDRs make and just go out to the motions of like, oh, everyone else is doing the same thing. So oh, be creative, like get outside the box, like make sure you're organized. Make sure you're not being sporadic. If you do those things, it'll be great. Perfect. Well, I I do have a couple of rapid fire questions, if you don't mind. Let's go. I think these are, they're they're not going to be like, we'll we'll do a couple of different ones too, but these are going to be a little bit more introspective. So if you don't, if you can't answer right away, it's cool, but let's try to keep these to like a sentence of concise wisdom. All right. Rapid fire round. Here's the first question. When you think of the word successful, who's the first person that comes to mind? Gary Vaynerchuk. (laughs) <laughs> my guy your guy have you ever met gary i've met him three times yeah how is he in real life uh it's very genuine um uh, very he'll get answer my questions like really good conversation even though he's massively busy he will actually intently listens like it's actually fascinating and i know these rapid fire questions but it's actually fascinating how intentional he is when he's in person like there's a thousand people around him and he's like locked into you and your question i, I think that's a that's something that i picked up from him and i've tried to do better at very interesting What's a common misconception about you? Oh, that all I do is make videos. <laughs> and that's, that's the only thing I do. I think, and also like strategies too. I think those are the two things. I think people think all I do is just work really, really hard and there's no strategy behind it. And then all I do is just make videos and that's all I do. So well, I'm going to tackle those two right now. One is, yes, I work really hard, but everything I do is very, very, very strategic. Like there's a plan and method for every single thing that I do. Nothing's done by mistake. Nothing is. I, I make sure everything's orchestrated. I think it pretty well thought out. So there's always a plan. And two, no, I don't always make videos, right? And just make content. Like everything that I make content on is stuff that I actually do because uh, I can build and be a practitioner of it. So every webinar and training I do is stuff that I actually do and see results from. So it's not just like I'm a talking head, which you can fall into that trap on LinkedIn real quick, just being a talking head because people see your content because they don't know what you do. But yep. nah, that's probably the big two misconceptions that people have with me. What's your deepest regret in life so far? 
I would say I, I try not to have regrets in my life. I don't like having that viewpoint. I think there's things I could have done better. And I would say the one thing I could have done better is maximize my skill set as a basketball player. It's not something I regret, but I think I could have maximized it. I think I could have gone a lot further if I would have taken it as seriously as I have done my career so far. And back in the day, I just wasn't serious about a lot of things. And that just goes into like work ethic. But obviously now that I'm at where I'm today, I've taken things very seriously and I've seen results. So I'd say that was one thing. I wish I could have maximized more on that basketball skill that I had because I genuinely love basketball. And I think if I would have trained more, I would have been better. I, I actually love basketball too. Are, are you yeah. a, are you a, an NBA fan? Huge NBA fan. Okay. Are you a Hawks fan? No, I'm not. That's that, <laughs> no way. That's miserable. <laughs> so do you have a team that you follow? I do. I mean, I, they're not, and people, oh, they're more miserable, but I have to, I follow the Orlando Magic, but they were, at least oh, they nice. made it to the final. At least they made it to the final. So <laughs> they had a couple good. They had the Shaq, Penny Hardaway years, Shaq, and then Penny Hardaway, Dwight Howard, Dwight Howard, Peter Turkoglu, Courtney Lee, and Jam- Jameer Nelson. Like that team, that was a good team. I love how the the two comparisons there was Shaq and Penny Hardaway, and then the second one was Hito Turkoglu and Dwight Howard. That's not really equivalent. Not equivalent, but hey, they made it to the finals <laughs> and they had to face Kobe Bryant. So if they didn't face Kobe Bryant, they could have won that. That's right. <laughs> Instead, it was a clean sweep. Yeah, straight sweep. <laughs> well, who you got this year? Because Toronto's already taken game one, so spoiler alert. I, have the, I have I have the Warriors. Like, yeah, I, I do not see Toronto really win this. And if they do, like more kudos to them. Like, I'm actually okay with Toronto winning. Yeah. Like, the city deserves it, right? But the it's the Warriors. Like, they're gonna be fine. Yeah. KD's gonna come back in game three. It's gonna be fine. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all right. <laughs> all right. This is the last rapid fire question. That was, I mean, the last couple were not rapid fire at all. I were to say, I'm going to make a movie of your life and you got to pick the genre that it would be and the actor that would play you. What would be your picks? Oh, these are good questions. Okay. So I definitely would be, I think it would be like a, because this is a good question because I think it'd be like a mix of action sci fi, to be honest, just based on me loving sci fi and then me. Just, I know, adventure and sci-fi, let's change that. Because my life's just been a complete journey. Um, and then also, like, sci-fi, because I love sci-fi. And then I would definitely have to choose Idris Elbra, for oh, sure. Like, he's man, just, that is a great choice. Or, or and like, if, like, he's not available, I'm choosing Morgan Freeman, because that's what I was named after, so. Is that right? Yeah, my parents named me after Morgan Freeman. Can you do the Morgan Freeman voice? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been uh, practicing it. I'm not going at it, right? Like, Back in the day, like he's his voice is <laughs> his unreal. voice is, is just too good. Like there's no way. Yeah, well, I, I like the Idris Elba pick. I love Idris Elba. He's like I'll watch anything that that guy's in. Oh, absolutely! Like he's so good, so good. <laughs> even The Office. He was in The Office. I didn't even know. Yeah, that. yeah, he was in The Office. Okay, well, I need to go check that out. Then. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, that's it for rapid fire round. That's it for the whole shebang. But Morgan, I would love to give you a chance to talk about what you're working on right now, what's important to you, and if there's anything that anybody should check out that you're doing right now. Yeah, I mean, no, nothing crazy. I mean, really to connect with me, Morgan J. Ingram on LinkedIn, um, that's pretty much my one call to action. Uh, we're working on like public cold calling workshops across the, the world here doing different technique stuff. And that's been cool. But you know, the whole thing you know, here is just to give you all some value. Hopefully it's helpful. It can help you along your career. But if you want to connect with me, Morgan J. Ingram on LinkedIn. All right. You heard the man. Go connect with him. I highly endorse it. He is a fantastic follow. I'll follow him myself. And Morgan, it was a pleasure having you on and have a great rest of your day. Absolutely, man. Keep it easy. All right. And that's it for today's episode. Again, if you're a first time listener or you've been at it since the beginning, please go ahead and rate, review and subscribe if you haven't already. Wherever you get your podcast, we've got you covered anywhere you want.